What's up, everyone? Today, we're going to continue talking about the High Republic. We're going to specifically be talking about a test of courage and not just with anyone. We have Justina Ireland joining us today, the author of the book. Thank you so much for taking some time out to talk with us. That was awesome. Thanks so much for having me. And congratulations on uh, hitting New York Times bestseller uh, number two. That's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it, yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those things. It's like it doesn't matter how many times it happens. It's always awesome. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I know everyone's excited. I'm excited that the High Republic is doing so well because I am very into this era. I think it's off to a great start, uh, and we're going to talk about it in just a second. But as a quick icebreaker. I just like to ask everyone uh, that comes on uh, a little question about their fandom. Specifically, um, my favorite Star Wars character is Big Starklighter, and I love to hear kind of who uh, everyone loves that's not like a main character, but who would you say is your C or D list character? Maybe someone that you think you are the biggest fan of in the world. Uh... <laughs> This is gonna be stupid, and I. This is just kind of me. But the Porg screaming in <laughs> the Falcon at the at the end of uh, the Last Jedi, like I like that that gif, it was like played on repeat, and it's always a scene when we watch it because as my my uh, daughter is a huge fan of the sequel trilogy, um, I always go back through. I always rewind because I'm just like I love it. He's just like. Wah! <laughs> I mean, like, and I, I don't know. Like, I, I've, I've always been a huge fan of um, the critters in Star Wars, um, just because I feel like there's. How can you hate a pork? Like, how can you hate an Ewok? Like, I feel like those are the things. Like, you know, a Sarlacc pit. That's that's insane, right? That's intense. And so I just, I've always really enjoyed the creatures. But uh, it's funny because we were actually talking um, among the other Luminous folks, and then we were talking about how much we love the Muppets. And I think it's just like that same kind of love because so much um, of of the of the non-human characters in uh, Star Wars always remind me of the Muppets um, for good reason, of course. Obviously, like you know, the Frank Oz um, impact. But yeah, like I think I think it's I think it's that port. I think that's like the character that like that you know. I, I mean, I, like most of my other characters I love are characters people would know, I would think would know, um, like Sana Staros and Mace Windu and. Uh, and those kind of folks. So yeah, to that pork, that pork sitting on the like, like the the dashboard, just screaming in fear or delight or who knows, it's a pork. So. I love it. Okay, well, uh, let's get into the High Republic. Um, you come from writing a lot of young adult, but most of your Star Wars books so far have been at the middle grade level. I'm curious, what are the challenges that come with writing a a shorter book while you're like creating this huge new era of Star Wars? Um, one of the reasons I do love uh, writing middle grade is because it is so challenging because it's 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 not just the shorter storytelling because obviously um, you can have middle grade books that are longer if you think about like the, the later end of like the Harry Potter books and especially um, a lot of the newer middle grades that are high fantasy are really long. Um, but the pacing has to be such that kids don't lose interest. And the thing kids really are interested in are our characters, like who they are and where they come from and 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 what they're doing and just like those those story beats. So like whenever I sit down to write, um, I always wanna make sure that my characters feel like kids or they feel accessible to kids. Um, when you talk about books um, like my other, you mentioned my other books, but like for example, both Lando's Luck and Sparks the Resistance um, have a, a mostly adult cast and trying to have um, a kid connect with adults, there has to be something there that feels um, similar, right? Because adults and children are very different. Um, you know, we all have like humanity, but you know, our our grasp of what's happening around us tends to be a little lesser as a child. And so one of the things um, I really like about middle grade is we, we have tough issues, like we have bad things happening, but the way we kind of ease the reader through those bad things is a little gentler. Right. So, you know, if you have a, if you have a death on the page or if you have something awful happening, like we tend to linger on it and we tend to like kind of help the reader get through that grief as well. Whereas in YA and adult, you're like, oh, on your own. <laughs> like, Good luck, friend. I hope you make it through. Um, so, yeah. So like, one of the things I, I, I do like is like um, is that you can you can slow it down a little bit, but not really. Um, so I like that, like that trying to, to pace. So like but 
to back to your question about the challenges, the challenges are the same with any book. Um, writing is is surprisingly um, similar across genres and mediums. Um, but the one thing you always have to keep in mind when you're writing is your audience. Like, who are you inviting into your story? Um, and so you want to make it as accessible as possible. And that's one of the reasons, um, you know, we talk about things like characterization and pacing is because, you know, like, what is the average, like, attention span, right, like, for the reader you're writing for? And so for younger kids, of course, we, we expect them to have a shorter attention span, although I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a very long attention span. I'm an adult-ish, um, I guess. And then for, you know, for YA, we tend to be a little bit. And then we also, again, that like the kind of the easing the reader through. Um, but we also don't want to overload with so many details. So, you know, if you are here for, like, the Jedi lore and, like, the nuance of hyperspace, you're probably going to get more of that in the adult book or the YA book. Um, you're not going to, we're not going to spend, you know, 10 pages explaining how um, a lightsaber works necessarily in a kid's book. We're going to be like, just a bullet point list, move on to the next thing. So. Well, you've already touched on a lot of things that I had questions about. And I, <laughs> I and spoilers too much. Like I was really surprised at some of the tragic events that happen in this book. Uh, and how do you do that? I guess maybe you've answered this a bit, just kind of slowing it down and easing into it. But how do you handle something like the great disaster or what happens in a test of courage while keeping in mind the age of the audience? I, the first thing I always do is I think about the fact that most kids have had tragedy, right? Most kids come through, um, there's a tragedy in life. Now, those tragedies might be really big, they might be really small, um, but, you know, like, we're right now living through a pandemic, and we're talking about, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of people have died in the United States. All of those people have kids, maybe grandkids, maybe nieces and nephews. Like, those are, those are children who've been impacted by that as well. So one of the things when I write for children is I don't want to dismiss their like the stuff that they've been through their experiences i want to to you know assume that that they've had either some knowledge or that they they can understand it i mean this is i mean these are they're not writing chapter books so we tend to talk about chapter books are for really young children like they're your first readers your early readers middle grade you know we're eight to twelve um and that's a big range age-wise anybody who has children can tell you there's a big difference between eight and twelve um but about that age is when you start to realize how the world works around you. You know, most eight and nine year olds have an idea of the concept of death of like, you know, you die and you're not here anymore. And where you go after that, that's, you know, that's up for discussion. But, uh, but we all know that that's, that's what happens. And so I think it's, you have to respect the child reader the same way you would want to respect the adult reader. And so um, maybe you don't want people blown to bits on the page. Um, but you definitely want to let them know, like, there is danger in this world. There's danger in this galaxy, even for the kids. And I think that earns you a younger reader's respect more than kind of talking down to them and like and like telling the story down to them. Because kids, kids are smart. Kids know. <laughs> kids have a strong BS filter, and especially in books. And they will pick up a book and they'll be like, ah this is preachy. I don't want this. Um, and so it's really about telling them a story and meeting them where they are. And sometimes where they are is where there's things get exploded. So. <laughs> sure. And uh, so you already kind of touched on this as well, but yeah, these uh, middle grade books often don't get into, yeah, like the nitty gritty stuff that like I love diving into, yeah, how a lightsaber works or how this ship works. But you do a really great job of talking about like, uh, the force or more thematically what it means. I loved what you had to say about, you know, one dark day doesn't mean you've fallen and you're gone to darkness forever, but also the opposite that it's like a constant struggle to stay in the light. So I I'd love to hear more about your philosophies in the force and that struggle. I think this is the, the force. Um, I always joke around because people are like, like, I'm not a, I'm not a religious person, but people are like, if, if you know, if I if there was a religion, I would be like the Church of the Force. That's where I would be because I'm obviously not a Jedi because I got no powers, no Force for sensitivity. Um, but like that's like that idea of we're all connected and that we all owe each other something because of that connectedness is um, is a really powerful one. And so uh, when we when I sat down to write this book, one of the things I, I really wanted to express, especially for you know, if this is if this is someone's first 
Star Wars book, if they've, you know, maybe seen the movies and watched some of the TV shows, but haven't read, picked up a book, I wanted to give them the best possible experience of reading a book. But I also wanted to show that these Jedi are different. Um, they're not nearly as, in my opinion, as dogmatic as we see towards the prequel era, right? Um, like, just think if they had, you know, if, if we had uh, allowed, if the force of the order had allowed like Anakin to have, you know, be married, um, that would have changed the whole story trajectory. So, and we know that, right? Because we've, we've lived through that era of storytelling, but these Jedi do not. And so I wanted to show, because, you know, not all Jedi have the same thought process, you know, like Vernestra tends to be a little dogmatic. She, you know, she tends to think that there's a, there's a way things have to be done and that doing things those ways will lead to success. And so, you know, having an older adult telling her, no, 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 slow down. Like it's, it's not that cut and dried. It's, it's, you know, we can, we can move through, you know, like we have to think about that. Also, I just think the Jedi should be compassionate. I just feel like, like if you are connected to every living thing in a galaxy and you are in, are in a position where you can see the forest and the trees at the same time and understand how it all works together, you should have more compassion. You should be empathetic. And I don't think that's a bad thing to teach children. I think children, you know, start out empathetic and then we teach them to be not that way, right? They live through experiences, you know, people ignore them, you know, they, they if they're, living through some sort of, you know, harshness or, or lack, they learn that way as well. You know, you work, you know, you, you run up against different personalities and have bad experiences and then you learn that as well. So I wanted to, to show that there's nothing wrong with that softness. There's nothing wrong with that, that reaching out to somebody and saying, Hey, are you okay? Like, Hey, what kind of day are you having? Like, Hey, I was thinking about you. Just want to let you know, I hope you're well. And I think that right now we tend to not do that. And I think when we're talking about Jedi and we're talking about um, making those decisions, it's it's really hard to think that like maybe, maybe just that one little event can set us on the wrong path. And I don't think that's true. I think it's a series of choices. I think with for whoever we become as a person, it's a series of continual cho choices. And so I wanted to make that clear because I think, um, so, so many times in books, it feels like things just happen. And I think sometimes um, when people absorb a story or, or in the storytelling, they're like, things just keep happening. Um, and I wanted to be very clear, even from a Jedi perspective, that we're making decisions. People are making decisions and that those decisions matter. Yeah. Uh, with the Jedi in this era, and yeah, you mentioned them being less dogmatic. What else was appealing to you and the other Luminous writers about uh, developing this specific era of Star Wars in the timeline 200 years before the prequels? I mean, one of the nice things is, you know, we do have the legend storytelling, but we don't have any uh, like more recent storytelling before the prequels. Um, and then that is still leaves, you know, it's only, it's still very close to the prequels. There's still, you know, thousands of years that like we're not, you know, we're not touching. But knowing where the order ends up, you have to ask that question, how did they get here? Right? How did they? Because because we hear we hear um, Obi Wan and Yoda both speak about the Order in very in, in very glowing ways. Um, but when we see them in the prequels, they're not they're not that. I mean, they're they're like like quite on me behind. Like like he's not like let me get you the, the Coruscant at least like set you up with the good. It's like no, you're in debt. Yeah, that's that's probably you know that's probably where you belong. I can't interv intervene. So. Um, I think a lot of us were like, how did they get there? How did they get to that point where they're, they're, you know, doing these diplomatic missions for the Senate? Um, they're supposed to be an order of, you know, like these warrior monks, and they're kind of doing like these political um, maneuverings and things. And so I think that the question we wanted to ask, like, well, well, how did they get there? Like, and then we said, you know, it has to be a good story. There has to be a reason where they end up, how they end up where they are. What does that story look like? And so I think it's really exciting to to know where you're ending up and knowing where like the big set pieces are, um, but be able to go back and kind of work in a, in a fresher sandbox, uh, so to speak, where like, you know, there aren't as many, you know, toys and such um, cluttering up the area. <laughs> so for me, that was really the, the exciting thing is, you know, because having written, you know, Spark of the Resistance and Land of Luck, you know, part of that storytelling is really maneuvering between the other story that's existed, storytelling that has existed, and also tying into it. Um, where in this case, you know, the stuff we're tying into is, is, you know, 
way down the road. Uh, and so we have a little more freedom in the kind of storytelling we want to do. Yeah. And, and that's something I have been really excited about for this era as well. As someone who grew up reading those Legends books, but this era was never really touched upon in Legends. So like mm -hmm. there's there's nothing really that, that this is just a clean slate. And I really love that. Um, there is a whiteboard that was shown that it's been floating around for the past like year or so where <laughs> uh, you all wrote what Star Wars means to you. And it's become a bit of a joke that Daniel Jose Older added like dinosaurs. I'm curious mm -hmm. what the most profound thing you added or weirdest thing. Do you have something that sticks in your mind that uh, was, was just a fun ad? I think, man, it's been so long since every once in a while I'll see like the, the whiteboard floating around. And it's really funny because it became such a like... Um, it was it was probably the first time where the, you were in the middle of storytelling and people saw like how your storytelling started and then they started making judgment about your storytelling <laughs> yeah. based off of like just some random words and I was like wow that's weird uh, <laughs> but I like I was like that's like you know because like you know the creative process is like you throw a bunch of things in the pot and then you take just as many things out of the pot and if, at the end of the day you might have spaghetti or or you might have chili like you're not really sure like what you're gonna end up with. Um, but I think I wrote, um, there was like some stuff about um, scoundrels, because I've, I've always been a huge fan of like the scoundrels of, of the, um, the scum and villainy. Um, and then there was also some stuff about relic hunters, um, because I'm a, like, I love Dr. Afra. I think um, it's probably my, yeah, it's such a, such a great comic um, and so much fun. And then there was some other stuff in there about like cute critters or something like that. And I'm not even sure it's like, on the board because we like wrote down everything on the board during brainstorming and then um one of the um editorial assistants went back and rewrote everything again and so sometimes like i'm not sure which whiteboard it was um but but suffice it to say everything that was on the whiteboard it's stuff that's already exists in star wars it's just i think seeing it when you see it disconnected from the whole it can be jarring so yeah, yeah. Uh, continue on talking about like developing uh, the, the High Republic and your characters. I was just watching the new episode of uh, Disney Insider and we got to see uh, all of your reactions to like seeing your characters drawn in concept art for the first time. Uh, what was that like? How did that feel? Because uh, that seems like something that doesn't happen all the time with books. I mean, I write, I come from the YA, right? The right YA sphere. And the only time you ever get to see any kind of rendering of your character is literally when you get a cover or someone does fan art. So it's like so rare. So to walk in um, to the, the art department at Disney and just see all of this art that, that people had been working on, right? I mean, these are characters that we came up with, that we had been living with, that we had been working on, um, that we maybe sometimes loved and didn't always. And so like going in and seeing them all on the wall like that, it was pretty damn amazing and I think you know I keep saying that word amazing because I'm like I'm like I need a thesaurus because I keep using that <laughs> word but there's really no other thing that like explains um how it is like I think the only thing like I I will, I will be backtrack the first time the second time I went to comic-con um as a Star Wars author um Disney had put me in the hotel and I was on the same floor as Billy D. Williams and so I was coming out of the elevator and there was this man going in the elevator with like a another like another guy who was like like you know holding his stuff and like talking to him. And it took me like a really long moment to realize it was Billy Day Williams. And like I'm staring at like the elevator and the doors are closing. I'm like and like I was like, Oh, I really should have brought like my land is like looks like a sign it and then I was like, Idiot, that land that cover is, is Dylan Donald Glover. Like that's not the right <laughs> yo. And so I feel like it's like that over that moment over and over again where like you're in the moment. And you're like, later, I'm going to appreciate this. But yeah. right now, I'm just going to stare open mouth like, a, like a, a, a weirdo because I have no other responses. <laughs> and so it's just, it's just I, I mean, I think it must be like pretty amazing for people who like write books and then have movies made for them because it's like you don't get that visual response. And then in, in, in my case, I'm terrible when I get art. Like um, Mike tends to send us, send us concept art you know he'll send you concept art and he'll say like this is this character and i'm like yay because i'm like it looks great and he's like i don't like this this and this and this needs to change and i'm like okay I just, i'm just excited there's art so yeah so it's pretty much that same like kid on christmas um response every single time 
That's awesome. Was there a, a a specific character that you wrote and got to see that you were really like, yes, this is it? Yeah, uh, definitely Avon and then uh, Vern, um, because I had written Avon and then I was like, I can't remember. I think maybe during the second draft um, in the in the the middle grade book, she has a like a little like a little um, robot that she finds, a little droid that she finds um, on the ship. That's like a like a scout droid. Um, and I was like, how is she connected? Like I, I had written it and then I went, was going back and revising it. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. How is she talking to the scout droid? And so I was like, oh, she needs to have like these, these like goggles or something. And then like the first time they did the concept art, she was like, like the like lab rat goggles, a little smudgy face. And it was like so cute. And then I was like, that is exactly how I imagined her. And same thing um, with Vernestra. One of the first pieces of uh, concept art that went out um, to share with folks was of the Jedi. And we have a picture of like one of the first pictures we have of Burn where she's kind of standing there and she's got the Padawan sash on, but she's kind of standing there with her hand on her hip and her lightsaber out with this like, I dare you kind of look. And I was like, that's so great. Like, that's awesome. So yeah. So th- I mean, but like, honestly, even seeing like, like other characters, con- you know, concept art is still fun. Like, I mean, like first time I saw Buryaga, I started laughing like a, like a mad woman. Cause I was like, I'm so lucky. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since you mentioned Avon and you you kind of talked about uh, Sana a little bit earlier that you're a big fan of that character, what made you want to bring a member of the Staros family into this story and this era? And what's the process like when you're working backwards in time to see kind of where Sana and her legacy came from? I, I was, um, so I, we had, I had created um, Avon and then there's a couple other characters that kind of go along with her, J6, the droid, and then her mother. And I was like, who is this family? Like, and we had the character's name, um, but we didn't really know where they were linked to. And Story Group was, and Story Group and Michael were like, what if she, what if they're Staros? And I was like, that'd be awesome. Um, because then it becomes this idea of if your mom is a senator in this time period, and then your, your descendant is like a scoundrel, what happens? Like, uh-huh. what's the story there like what how does your family fall out of favor um because you know people tend to be a little bit fixed in like where they where they exist in the like you know social spectrum and so like that was the the moment where i was like oh that makes me that means i like thinking about that um it actually once we had established that con- connection because i was like yeah i love, I love sauna that would be super cool um it let me lean into some of that mystery Mischievousness that we see in Avon a little more because it's like, all right, like you're gonna have a descendant who's gonna like show up and be like, that's my husband, <laughs> Solo, right? And I was like, that audacity, right? I like, I want, I want to see like where does she, where, what are her people like? And so like with when I was writing Avon, you know, I kept that character in mind a lot because I was like, you know, this is who her descendants gonna be like. You know, how audacious is Avon gonna be? And the the answer is, you know, pretty pretty damn (laughs) (laughs) there's a lot of that going around with the yeah we have the jedi and we have the staros clan and the santeca clan and they're all like in these really high status areas and then when we see them later on it's like what happened here (laughs) (laughs) um and and talking about uh vernestro again i'm always curious like how do you settle on uh like miri alien when you're developing a character uh is there a thought process or is it just a preference or uh what was it about that species <laughs> that that uh connected with Vern? I really liked um Barris Offi. Is it Barris Offi? Barris Offi? Mm-hmm. I always mispronounce everything. I mispronounce like like I do too. Regular English words, right? <laughs> like adjective. Um but yeah, so I really always really liked that character. And I always felt like we never got enough time with I think we never get enough time with non-human Jedi, with the exception of Yoda. And I think um, that's really been always been one of my, like, I'm really interested. Like, what is it like to be a non-human Jedi, right? Like, does your is your connection to the Force colored by by your physicality? Like, is that different? Um, you know, do you have, you know, is there, is there, are there just more human Jedi by the time we get to the prequel era and their era and there were more like non-human species Jedi before that? Like, I don't know. Um, so I really wanted to have a, a main character who was non-human because I also think, um, 
people tend to have a pretty visceral response um, to human characters in a way of, you know, why isn't that character white? Why is that character black? <laughs> why isn't that character black? You know, like whatever that is. And I think when you have a non-human character, sometimes it's easier to have those, those conversations about um, what we owe one another and like, you know, the social contract and, you know, what does it mean to, to you know, choose goodness over, you know, choose the light over the dark. Um, it's a little easier sometimes when people don't bring their bias and their baggage to it. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to have a non-human character is because um, I just, I mean, you don't have necessarily um, as many fan types. Yeah. And sometimes you just want to tell a story and, and you know, not do that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think that the High Republic era so far has done a really great job of like just telling a story that I feel like we we need right now of, yeah, the great disaster. All these different disasters are going on, but like everyone is coming together to solve yeah. problems together like oh, that. Nice. Yeah. It's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Vernestra has a light whip and I think that's awesome. Uh, what made you want to bring that lightsaber design back into Star Wars? Because I believe this is the first time uh, we've seen that in the new canon. I think it is. And <laughs> the reason I did it is, is very contrary. And it's a terrible weapon. <laughs> the idea of a, a plasma whip is a terrible idea. <laughs> because as soon as you make a mistake, you're going to cut your body in half. So like, like, I was like, you know, like, how do I show that like maybe like she's operating on a different level, but also have something that's gonna be really fun visually and like kind of unique in, in, within the story. Um, and so I'm like, I'm gonna give her a light whip. And I honestly didn't think they'd let me. <laughs> like, I, kept, I kept expecting the note like, no, absolutely not. Um, and mostly there's just the notes were like, maybe a reminder of how dangerous this whip is for her to use. And I'm like, that's a good reminder. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I just, I mean, we always, whenever we, like the, in Legends, the Light Whip would show up, you'd just be like, oh, like, <laughs> like, like it's just, it's just like, it's such a dangerous weapon. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really, I really dig it. I really dig it. Cause it's, it is so, so just like, what do you do with it? Like how, yeah. you know, like all of a sudden you're just like this, this, you know, rope of energy that can cut through just about anything. Um, so and I, it also gives me a challenge in the storytelling. It's like, how do I make this useful and not just like this thing this character has? How do I make it something that she has she comes to rely on as a Jedi as as being part of her toolkit? Mm -hmm. and, and I like what you had to say about like uh, Emery is going. Well, didn't Darksiders use that? And yeah. like, well, that doesn't make me a dark side user or anything. It's just it's a tool and it's all about how you use it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. we're going to keep following uh, Vernestra and Emery in Out of the Shadows, your next book, which is going to be Young Adult. Uh, what is that like? Kind of, I guess in my mind, I'm envisioning that these characters are going to grow up and like the storytelling might grow up a little bit with it. it what, what's that going to be like? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's going to be a YA book. So the storytelling will definitely be um, a little more mature, a little, a little more. <laughs> the body count will be higher. Um, <laughs> there will be a, a little more, you know, in-depth discussion. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be the same characters. It's going to be the same, the same characters. If you enjoy following characters through different pieces of media, like, right? you know, um, whatever your favorite character is, it's going to be exactly the same. They're not going to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, become completely different people because obviously, you know, the time and the storytelling is only a little bit down downstream from where we are now. Um, but you are going to get to see them experience some of the stuff. And I also think, you know, like these are all tied together. So even though the characters in A Test of Courage are not there to experience the great disaster or the damage that and, and loss of life that happens in the Hetzel sector, they are still impacted by it. They're still affected by it. The same way we're all affected every single time there's a disaster, you know, but this pandemic, 9-11, Oklahoma City bombing, like all of those are things that I wasn't necessarily present for, but still impacted my life greatly. So one of the things that's really great about YA is we get to dig into that a little bit. It's like, how is this impacting? You know, the Jedi have not fought. They're not, they're not, these are not um, Jedi who are, are used to fighting, right? These are Jedi who are used to protecting mm -hmm. and preserving life. And so you have to wonder, like, how does that impact them all of a sudden now that, you know, they've been through this great, you know, um, trauma, you know, how does that start to change how they, they view not only their, 
the force, but their interactions with other people. So that's what I'm really excited. And that's what you're going to get in the YA, but also still like lightsaber action and, and pew, 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 and all that cool things that you love about Star Wars. Yeah. Um, would you say that there are any advantages to writing young adult over middle grade or are there more challenges? Um, you get a bigger word count. <laughs> more <laughs> words. Um, yeah, so you have a little more uh, story to play with. I always say um, short stories seem like the easiest way to write a story. They're the hardest because you have the least number of words and the shortest time to tell a story. Um, writing a YA book, you get um, most YA books are between um, 90,000 and like 120,000 words. Um, so that seems like a lot, a lot of words, but it's, you know, when you think about a, a middle grade book, it tends to be between 45,000 and 60,000 words. It's a lot, a lot of words. So it's a lot more story. So um, the pace will be probably about the same as middle grade, but there'll be a lot more stuff for, for the characters to do. Cool. And you're also, it was recently announced, you're going to be writing a, a manga called The Edge of Balance. Yes. Uh, yes. That, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> that's still in flux. That's still, but yeah, that's, and that's completely different as well. Um, like, but the thing is, it's all storytelling. So it's sort of just like looking at the format and like, what can we do? But I'm excited about the manga because it's like that visual component. You know, there's going to be a lot more visual stuff. And I'm working on that um, with, you know, a, a Japanese um, author and a Japanese artist. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really um, focused on that manga style with like that Star Wars. So I think it's, you know, it's not going to be like, a Star Wars that happens to be a manga, it's going to be a manga that more that happens to be Star Wars. So for for like manga fans who really love that that storytelling, um, they're going to be they should be pretty excited about that. I, I'm sure that we're entering now the the questions where you can't answer, but can't, it like that story <laughs> is very mysterious right now. Is there anything that you can tease us about what to expect, who we might follow, or what we might see? I'm going to say no. Because uh -huh. <laughs> because I I am probably the worst person to ask about like spoilers because I never remember what I'm allowed to talk about and what I'm not. So I just talk about nothing. Uh, so sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going to share anything. But I think you should learn more shortly because the book comes out, I think, in first beginning of June now is I think when it comes out. I think it's the, the release date. So you should start to see teasers and some, maybe some concept art from that as well. If if you could sum up your feelings towards uh, the edge of balance and out of the shadows in one word for each story, what what would it be? Work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's work. Um, no, it's. I mean, it's fun. It's it's Star Wars. I'm. I mean, I think all good Star Wars. All Star Wars is better than no Star Wars, and all Star Wars is good Star Wars, and. You can argue about you know this, that, or the other, but at the end of the day, it's just great to have Star Wars. You know, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm one of the I'm one of the older fans they always talk about who like grew up with like the original you know trilogy, and so like I remember there was like a long time like where Star Wars felt like it was never going to come back, and then it did. Um, so and then we you know we went to another long time where it felt like Star Wars was just you know because I've always obviously like most people the movies were um, my tentpole. Uh, but yeah, I just, I think it's that thing. I just like fun, fun. I just want, I, I think it should be fun. I have always said that about Star Wars. It should be fun and it should be enjoyable and it should be fulfilling. Yeah. I completely agree. And uh, about what you're saying about uh, just the the variety. We have yeah. friends at Four Center Podcast who liken Star Wars to a buffet that it's just, there's so much to choose from and that's how it should be. And it's like, you might not like that thing over there, but you probably mm -hmm. love this thing over here. And I like the High Republic to me is just more variety in eras. And I, it's really landing for me so far. Uh, I'm all about it. I'm all in. But uh, what other <laughs> what what other stories have you written that uh, might be up a Star Wars fan's alley? Not necessarily your Star Wars books, but your other YA yeah. works. Yeah, so um, I also wrote a book called Dread Nation. I'm actually looking to see if I have a copy. I usually have a copy it's on my desk somewhere, but I do not today. Um, but I wrote a book about Dread, called Dread Nation, and it's about the zombie apocalypse starts at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so <laughs> if you're a Star Wars person who also likes, you know, speculative fiction and um, zombies, that might be your jam. Um, if you like Greek mythology, um, my second book, Promise of Shadows, um, follows a harpy. Um, who was cursed to the pits of Tartarus and then kind of has to make her way back to the, the real world. Um, so it's like Greek mythology set alongside, you know, our world. So it's more of a contemporary fantasy. 
Um, and I think if you're a middle grade reader, I have a middle, my first me middle grade, um, my first non IP middle grade is coming out in May and it's called Opie's Ghost. And it's sort of like um, Great Gatsby meets, um, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, um, oh gosh, I can't think of it. The one with the kids who's dead people. Oh, Sixth Ooh. Sense. Sixth Sense, thank you. <laughs> it's like Great Gatsby meets Sixth Sense with a dash of Get Out. And so it's sort of like, it's about a girl in the 1920s. Um, her father votes, uh, they live in Georgia and her father votes and of course he's lynched. Um, and then that the night that they come to burn down her house after he's been lynched, she discovers she can see ghosts, um, which is a, just a slight spoiler, but that's just the, the prologue. And then once she, um, they, her, her and her mother flee uh, north. So it's like 1922 um, and they end up getting jobs in this big, very haunted house. And since she can see ghosts, <laughs> it's a, a little different for her. So yeah, that comes out in May. Those all sound great. <laughs> yeah, <thanks. laughs> <laughs> you sold me. Uh, so as we wrap up, just where can people find you online? Where can they follow you and uh, find your books or learn more about you? You can find me at my website, justinaireland.com. Um, there has a, there's a link there to my local indie and there's always a place you can buy signed books. Um, or if you don't buy my local indie, buy it from your local indie because indies matter and they are great and they are always looking out for their customers. Um, other than that, you can find me on Twitter as at Justina Ireland. I'll put links to and all that. It. Yeah, I'll, I'll put links to all that in the description. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh, well, thank you again so much, Justina, for taking some time to speak with us. Uh, this was great. I'm so looking forward to everything else the High Republic has to offer uh, and your future books. But uh, thank you, everyone, for watching along, and may the force be with you. <laughs>